Right, it's two o'clock. Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing all right. Welcome along if it's your first time and welcome back if it's not your first time and you've been following this series. So this is the third portrait exercise that we're going to do today. The first um, was about uh, trying to get a three dimensional head rather than thinking about um, a flat surface like a plate, thinking about it three dimensionally like a baked bean can. The second one was about eyes. And then today is uh, going to be the third installment and I'll reveal what that was in a little bit. But first of all, we need to do a recap. Right, so the challenge for you last time was to make a museum. So the last episode was about colour and I made a museum of green and I was finding objects from around the house and then laying them out in a really careful way to um, make a museum of the color green. Everything from natural materials to artificial materials. And then we talked about color mixing after that. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, some of you said that I was starting to demystify things a little bit. So that's really, really good, really helpful feedback. Um, art shouldn't be a mystery. Um, if it is a mystery, then um, I think uh, maybe that's because people want to keep those kind of secrets to themselves. But yeah, hopefully we can um, demystify things here. Uh, the more feedback I get, um, the more questions you ask, the easier it is for me to uh, think of things to do. So yes, keep all those comments coming, please. Um, so the first one I want to show you um, is the Museum of Blue. And this comes from Bev and she's arranged it really nicely. I think it actually came that way around to begin with, but just so you can get it a slightly bigger. Um, actually, no, we'll, we'll, have it, we'll have it that way around. I think that looks all right, doesn't it? I think that's the way it was photographed. Um, what I really, really love about this, can you see those shadows? Can you see the way the light comes in and there's everything, especially that car, look at that. Everything has got a really beautiful shadow to it. All the shadows are being cast in the same direction obviously um, and I think that really um, that really looks beautiful and also this color grading looks great doesn't it from the pale blue at the bottom right through to that indigo denim dark blue and navy at the top um, and lots of things in there and a really good range of things that we recognize like the Savlon tube to the scissors and then uh, other things like I don't <laughs> I don't know what that is it looks like um no, it looks like a Lego brick cap or something. Um, so yeah, that one really uh, well done, uh, Bev. And then there's another one here. And this one is from Claire and is obviously the Museum of Yellow. What I really, really like about this one is I was talking about the surface that it goes on. Um, small table, big table. But what I really like here is it's an oval table, but Claire has organized it into a square. And I think that's um, really, really spectacular. And I love the idea of an oval frame with something square um, being curated inside it. And uh, there's lots of interesting things there. I, I, would, I would have loved to hear what, ones, what items you removed, actually. I thought that would be uh, quite interesting to see. And on there, I can't really see anything that I'd, I'd take away. But I really, really, I love that rosette with these different with the different yellows there um, and for me that's less about a color gradient but just about a really kind of good organization there's good space between everything um, but yeah I really really love the framing and then the last one is the museum oops sorry about that the museum of red um, and that comes from Laura and yeah much simpler, fewer objects, but I think you can see the color gradient across that from the orangey red on one side, um, right through to that deep wine burgundy color on the other side. Um, I guess different object, different colors have different um, ranges of color um, that the objects are made from, but I really, really like this one because I think um, it's got a very good balance of the negative space, and not, by negative space I mean the space around the objects, the white space. Um, there's space quite widely, um, but I really, really like how that looks. I think it looks excellent um, and very, very carefully put together. Um, and I really love things like that bottom line along there. So it's got interest all the way through that when you look at it. So really congratulations to you guys, uh, well done. Some of you said that that was a bit harder than you thought it would be. Um, 
but I guess you never really know until you try something, right? So um, some things you think are going to be easy and some things you think are going to be really uh, difficult and they turn out quite easy and vice versa. And um, so all it is is about uh, having a go, seeing if you can get it right. Uh, if it's not right, trying it again. Nobody gets things right the first time. Uh, I think always you have to um, try very, very hard over and over and over again. And you know, don't cling to a mistake just because you take uh, you took a long time making that mistake. If something's not right, start again, and uh, it will be quicker and better the second time. Okay, so uh, uh, I think everybody is constantly learning those kind of things. So yes, well done, everybody. Okay, so the the topic today is about portraits. So again, I think that's probably quite a popular subject. And I put a little um, poll out on Twitter that work? Um, to ask you guys what you wanted to know um, when it comes to making a portrait. So what do you need help achieving? A good likeness, a good painting, good character, or just starting the damn thing? So I think, of course, we know that everybody is obsessed with the good likeness um, when it comes to a portrait. Um, I think that's very much on people's minds. Um, so I'm going to be covering that today. And I'm also going to be just um, two ways to start a portrait. Um, I don't really have a problem with starting a portrait, but I guess a lot of people are very scared of a, bank, a blank canvas and very daunted by that. <coughs> so um, we're going to be looking at ways to start something, which um, again is something I wouldn't have thought of on my own. And it really only um, comes from you guys asking me things that you want to know about. So thank you for that. So those are going to be the two things. Look at that, 7% of good painting. So it can look really, really terrible, but um, yeah, it doesn't even need to uh, be a terrible painting, but as long as it looks good, then, um, then that's what's important. Okay, so um, those are the things that we are going to be working on. Right, so I... In preparation for today's session, I did something really horrible this morning. I took a cold shower. And I read somewhere that research shows that if you take a cold shower in the morning, and I hate cold water, what that does is it sets you up for the day and nothing can be, or the chances are that nothing is gonna be as bad as that cold shower. So if you start the day with a freezing cold shower, at least everything that comes after that isn't gonna be so bad. And that's gonna be my attitude and philosophy for um, the first part of this tutorial. And in preparation for it, I promise you, I did have a very, very horrible cold shower. So I think what I'm gonna talk about there is um, thinking about starting a painting. Uh, starting a portrait and we are going to start with I think everyone's talking about this lady a lot this week so we're going to start with um, using as the starting point this wonderful photographic image of um, the Queen and I thought that would be a good place to start it was quite difficult for me to I've got a few people who I'm going to be using in this um, but I thought this would be a good starting point so I'm really only using that as um, an example of how to start. So if you were to start and you had a blank canvas in front of you like this, I'm just gonna draw the canvas out. Something I think that is pretty important here is to think about how you are going to start, right? So there's a really complicated image here. We've got somebody really recognizable. We have some purple shiny pattern drapes forming the background. There's a human figure in front of us. There's to the left of the image there's a very ornate gold uh, chair which again has another color and another patterned material on it um, there's a very beautiful uh, embroidered dress which has a lot of detail in it it has form through those curves but it also has a lot of visual complexity um, there's a sash there's lots of jewelry there's lots of detail in there and 
uh, you're painting the queen, right? So you've got to do a really good job. Um, so there's pressure. So all those things that we see when we look at an image can be really, really complicated and can really make us panic and not know where to start. So this is for anybody that really doesn't know where to start when they're doing a painting. So I'm going to do two things here. I'm going to do a painting and I'm going to do a drawing. And um, they are both going to start, obviously, in a very different way. And I'll explain something at the end, which is just a kind of different mindset and a different way, <coughs> excuse me, different way of working. So I think with this image here, with all that complexity, I don't want to focus on a detail, something that I, I recognize, like the, the brooch that's got a cross on it. Uh, I know I could start with that, but that's going to be really difficult to start um, getting good confidence and, and um, be a really, really bad place to start. Likewise, starting with an eye or something familiar, that would also be really, really difficult. So my proposal is this, that in doesn't matter how big your canvas is that you set yourself a goal of about five minutes to cover the entire canvas and what that will do that will ground you and it will start to really reassure you as to um, making a really really good start that will make a little bit more sense in a minute okay so what i'm going to do i'm going to start by just blocking in some color here so i'm going to ooh, i've got a really strange brush no there we go Oops, sorry, that went wrong. Right, I'm going to select a purple color here. And I'm just going to block in the background. So giving myself a time of around about five minutes. And you'll see, I want to show you this because I want to show you how to go about working. So get a big, thick decorator's brush and start to just make some big progress, blocking in some cover, color and covering a big area. Um, I realize I'm not doing that on a canvas. It's partly because I don't have a canvas and I'm not going to go out and buy one. Um, but also I can show you much better on the tablet the principle of what I'm talking about. Right, and then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a really bright color there. And if you've seen the earlier tutorials where I talk about this, I'm going to just think about where the flesh color comes. And I'm going to just very roughly block that in, in green. Um, and I'm going to continue that actually down into the the main part of the dress. So I'm really not worrying about detail here. Um, my aim is to cover the whole, the whole canvas. Um, and I'm going to take another color there and block in some color here. Right, so that, that point where everything is covered in a few minutes is really, there's, there's some benefits I want to talk about here in terms of why why you do this so the reason why you get to this point is that if you've got this basic composition right you know that the head is not going to stick out of the top of the canvas you're going to be able to finish everything and also that when when you're when you're working in a really quick way like this this is really horrible right and this goes back to the shower thing this morning if you start with this point, you can really only make your painting better from this point because this is kind of like a horrible, ugly start. But it gives me some reassurance that the composition is right. It gives me reassurance that I can get all that nervous energy out onto the canvas really quickly and rough out the, um, the blocks of color where I want the image to sit. But more than that, it, yeah, it goes back to that thing of, I think a lot of us, when we when we make a piece of artwork, we can overwork things. And so you start something off, you get a bit more confident, you kind of try to correct things and you go through a little bit further. And then before you know it, it's kind of got not very good and you've, you've killed it. And I think if you start from this point, which is a sort of really difficult um, uh, point in terms of beauty, it's not a beautiful image, you're going to be just whatever you do to this, you're going to be making it more beautiful as you go along. So 
in a few minutes, try and cover the cameras. That's my first tip to get right. So then if we look at this, what I would then do, I would then start to think about using a smaller brush, start to think about putting in some flesh tones. So looking at the subject, but thinking about where, where the flesh tones might lie in, in the image that you're painting. So I've gone down in brush size, but not too much because I do here, all I really want to do is start to block in some color and where the flesh lies, where the skin tone is, and just keep on adding a little bit as you go through. And you'll find really quickly that you'll, again, get to an approximation of something which starts to, starts to look like you're getting the human figure right. So again, it's, th this tutorial, I suppose, is about not starting with too much detail. So, or not starting with any detail actually, and just trying to think about getting the paint onto the canvas, getting the nervous energy out there and just starting from a point um, that is um, maybe not what you think is your best painting, but is maybe a different way around working. I see so many people starting drawings and they'll start with something, um, if they're drawing, um, an interior, they might start with a door handle because that's something familiar. If people are, are drawing a portrait, they might start with um, an eye. So if I'd started with an eye on this canvas, that dictates where everything else is. So really this was just about blocking in some color. Um, the green color is the opposite color of flesh tone. So that will really push the flesh tone forward and make a more three-dimensional um, convincing image on your canvas. So in a few strokes with a very small amount of time, try and the next time you do something, uh, attempt a canvas, try and cover the canvas really quickly in about five minutes. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of that because I want to um, do another type of start. So I don't, I haven't really thought about this so much until I really started um, talking about my design process, um, sorry, my drawing process when, when I work. So the first one was for painting and the second one is for sketching. So I think I always start here for some reason. That's where I start to look. So if I was looking at that image, I start on the left shoulder and then start to just, you can see that coming through, start to block in some structure in terms of proportions and thinking about cross-referencing things like the junction in the elbow to the other side, the part of the face there, where the chin is in relation to that point there, where the sash is, where the dress comes down to, where the hand comes to. So again, this is not, this is like a structure. This is a framework, which is gonna really help me when it comes to putting some detail in. But this really isn't about detail. This is just about some reference points that you're putting down that will help you when it comes to describing a little bit more of what you can see in front of you. So again, this is a very rough outline of something, but once I have this in, I know that I'm, I'm not gonna go outside the canvas. I know that I have the, as I'm looking at it, the left hand, okay there, I've got the right hand, okay, the, the top of the head or the top of the crown is not gonna go outside of the canvas. And this for me is quite a reassuring way to work. So those are two different methods of starting out. So that's the first one. And that's the second one. I don't know, but they don't really overlap. So um, that's, a way that you can start a painting. I hope that helps. And um, the other thing that I think is worth mentioning at this point, 
Another thing that a lot of people do, they combine those two things together. So it becomes a little bit like a coloring by numbers exercise. So think people often think about drawing and painting, like I'm gonna draw the outline and then I'm gonna color those shapes in. So I just think that can be a little bit of a dangerous way to work because it's like, right, uh, it's really, really separating it. Like we do the drawing and when the drawing's right, I'm gonna do the painting. And you get the drawing right. And then when you do the painting, the painting doesn't kind of match up um, to the drawing. So just forget about drawing by numbers for one experiment. If that's, if that's what you tend to do and just start by painting, start by blocking in color and try and finish the canvas in five minutes. Just try and cover the canvas, I'm sorry, not finish the, the painting, but try and cover the canvas in five minutes just by blocking in some color. And then whilst you're waiting for that layer of acrylic to dry, um, you can start really, really looking, maybe do some preparatory sketches of your sitter and really just start um, to think of what you're going to do next. It kind of gets that tension out. Um, you'll probably be quite dynamic with your paintbrush um, as opposed to very kind of careful and tentative. And all that energy is good. And uh, again, it shouldn't be something that you're afraid of. It should be something to embrace. So I hope those are two um, tips for you in terms of starting. Right, then, in terms of this next thing, I want to talk about likeness. So the thing about likeness that is very important to get right is this part. So I'm going to show you a well-known person. And what we're going to be looking at here is Philip Schofield. Um, what I want to show you here is I want you to think about this, this triangle between the center of the pupil and the tip of the nose. Okay, that's what we're going to be think, focusing on for the next 10 minutes. This triangle between the tip of the nose and the center of the eyes is really, really critical to getting a good likeness. I want to show you something. Right, so if Let me go back to here. If I take that part and I move it a little bit, just move it that way. And I do the same thing here. Sorry. So I'm moving this millimeters, right? Um, So what I've done, I have moved, gosh, that looks really weird, doesn't it? What I've done there, I've moved his eyes in a little bit. Now, I think that looks like a completely different person. And the amount that I've moved is hardly anything. So look, if I get rid of those, get rid of that layer. If I get rid of those two layers, you can see from that to that is hardly anything. Now, if you're doing that on a painting, it's gonna be even more difficult. So I think, that's the first thing that I wanted to show you in terms of um, in terms of likeness, this triangle being really important. So if you look at this work, which is by Julian Opie, which is a very well-known front cover of a Blur album from probably about 15 or 20 years ago, what the artist here is doing is just simplifying the face, but it's really critical. You can, you can re recognize the people just from where they're their pupil and irises in relation to their nose and he's done that in a super minimal way and I'll show you how easy that can be if I 
do that on myself. So there's a picture of me. And if I make this layer almost so you can't see it, and just get rid of those right so if um if i use this if i use this brush and i just work on where my eye is and a little bit big where my nose comes to and then go around the outline of my face. And then probably need to have that in as well. Just that small amount of line will describe my face because if we go back to I don't know does he do yeah he does eye, eyebrows as well okay so we'll I'll put that in and the thing that I think is right here which makes that just I look quite angry describe my face as opposed to somebody else's is this triangle so remember what we're looking at is the triangle between the center of the pupil the tip of the nose so that triangle being really important. So the first thing I want to show you about that is if we look at this really cute picture of a baby here. Now, when, when kids are that tiny, if you look at what happens to the triangle here, so from the tip of the nose, we go, sorry, that's a little bit big. Let me get a slightly smaller, smaller brush. If we go from the center of the pupil to the tip of the nose, and we join that up. Look how flat that triangle is, okay? So it's really, really important that you see the relationship between not only the width of the eyes, but what that triangle looks like. So try and remember what that triangle looks like. And we're gonna look at another picture now. So that wasn't me as a baby, by the way, but this is me. If we then look here and we look at how that triangle, all babies look the same, right? So I suppose it doesn't really matter. If we look at the triangle that goes from my nose to the center of my pupils as a six-year-old, that triangle has changed. Okay, so look at that triangle and then look at the triangle on the baby. Can you see what's happened there? The triangle as a head of somebody get grows up as the as the bones change the relationship between the eyes and the tip of the nose changes a lot so that's quite a flat triangle then as you get older that triangle starts to change it starts to become less flat and then if we go back to this portrait of me here you'll see that the triangle is different again so the triangle starts to be steeper so i'll get rid of those two layers And we'll increase the opacity again and then I'll show you I'll, let's just see what happens so from here to the tip of the nose so the triangle is changing again so that's almost an equilateral triangle I would say whereas when I was younger it's a flatter triangle and then in my fake baby picture, it got flatter still. So when you're looking to do a portrait of anybody, really, really think about that triangle, <coughs> excuse me, the triangle, the relationship between um, the center of their eyes and the tip of the nose. That will also work if they look um, away from you. It doesn't, um, it still works if somebody isn't looking straight on. So that really 
is what I wanted to share with you today and what I wanted to show you. Um, the painting and drawing app I'm using is Procreate and it's on iPad. Um, it's really just because it translates much better when I'm broadcasting um, rather than something behind me um, on a canvas. So the challenge today is quite small, really. It's what it is. I would like you to find a picture of yourself when you were much younger, when you were a baby or a small child, and just focus on the triangle between your two eyes and the tip of your nose, and then a portrait a uh, picture of you uh, grown up or, or however you are now, and look at that triangle again, and see if you can notice a difference. So this challenge is not really about doing an amazing self-portrait at all. But what it is about is looking really carefully about those relationships, the relationships between the center of your eyes, the pupils, and the tip. And so, yeah, in effect, really, the challenge is just to draw two triangles and see if you can notice a difference next time you're working on somebody else's portrait or even a self-portrait. So that is all for today. And I will see you later on in the week, Thursday.